Hi, and welcome to Heart for the Lost. I'm your host, servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, and really just a whole bunch of redeemed dirt, Andy Bird. Glad to have you today. I've got a really fantastic program. If you've ever watched a program where Aaron Shafawalf has been on a program, you know there are ones to talk about. The guy is extremely intelligent. I mean, he's just he's just out there when it comes to to how smart he is. In left field. Left field. <laughs> yeah, in left field. He's He's got this philosophical nature to him where he understands and conceptualizes things that most people can't even contextualize. I mean, it's just amazing. And today he's going to help us with two things. One, uh, something that, uh, that he did just recently at the Compassion of Boldness Conference. And if you didn't go, if you missed it, I'm really sorry. James White spoke about the Trinity and about the accuracy of the New Testament. But we also had amazing, amazing plenary session by Mil Bill McKeever the first night, which was just phenomenal. And then Aaron Shafawalf did a little bit of what he's going to talk about. To he did a lot about what we're going to talk about a little bit today of. And that is that uh, he gave some witnessing tips, but he talked about some of the ideas that I've kind of coined the term. He was, he was using a different term for it, but I kind of coined the term of these floating doctrines. So we're going to talk about these two issues today. We're going to talk about things that will help you with your neighbors, with your family, with your friends, sharing Christ with them, especially here in this valley. So Aaron, welcome to the program, my Thanks friend. Thanks a lot for having it's me. It's good to have you, man. Um, hey, just uh, wanted to first and foremost turn off my cell phone, which is a, it's always an important thing to do before a program. <laughs> hey, so the Compassionate Boldness Conference. If people missed it, they can go get the audio, right? Yeah, you can go to MRM.org and make your way to the store where you can purchase the MP3s or soon the video files. So, man, you gotta you gotta take your cell phone and just just power it down before. I'm telling you, I, you do, know, do you Twitter during church too? No, no. I usually I usually have the cell phone taken care of, but today I don't know, you know, and and I'm praying. Some I don't always. Pray Are you beforehand. surfing the web in, during dinner? I, uh, you know, I did that during I Twitter during church one time, and I got caught by the pastor because <laughs> the pastor's wife saw it. Facebook, did Mark, Facebook. Mark Driscoll's church actually encourages their people to Twitter live. They have a, they have a Oh, really? Yeah, and they stream a lot of the comments of the live of the sermon. It's kind of neat the way they do it, I That's guess. That's why he's reformed emerging. That's why I, like I guess it. so. <laughs> okay, so they can go to mrm.org. Yes. And on mrm.org, there is the audio files for... Yeah, all of the audio is already published. It's okay. like three bucks per MP3 right now. You can, you can get... It's a deal. It's it's a deal, especially for James White's stuff. Oh. He's he's uh, listening to him is like it, it's what is this? so it's the um, fire hose. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> sure. It's like it's like getting a drink of water from a fire hydrant. Yes yes yes. So but here's here's what I want you guys to pay attention to. James White did his two sessions on listen. The Trinity is it biblical? Does it come from this book? And then he did the second one is, is this book reliable? And he talks about the New Testament in particular, and he does listen. The guy, I mean, he knows he knows Greek, he knows Hebrew, he's learning Aramaic. I mean, Arabic. He's learning Arabic. Arabic, Arabic yeah. Not Aramaic, Arabic. Thank you, because because the uh, the Muslims won't trust what he says unless he reads it in, uh, in Arabic. Yeah, Arabic. I think yeah. he likes to do debates with yeah, Muslim yeah. Scholars I mean, but the guy's amazing. So if you ever need to know any of his stuff, by the way, I'm going to give you the website. We're not going to post it. Um, there is a link off of our website from uh, heartforthelost.com to it, but it's aomin. Dot org. So A-O-M-I-N dot org. That's James White's website. Great place to go. Great podcast. So good stuff. You wanted right. to talk about some witnessing tips. Yep. That was the first thing. So let's get right into witnessing tips. So a lot of our viewers talk to their friends, their family, their neighbors, their coworkers. A lot of them are LDS. And they want to be able to share with them some of the distinctives that definitely separate our two belief systems. And the one that you shared was really powerful. Why don't you share that first one with us, the well, Isaiah the, one. The way I, I gave it is if you've got some missionaries that show up at your front door mm -hmm. and you're in your bathrobe <laughs> and you've got two minutes maybe, right. um, this is just a really cool way you can share God's word. And I would suggest, at least for this purpose, not using the word Bible, not using the word scripture or God's word. Instead, um, appeal to the Bible as God's testimony. And so what I like to do is ask the Mormon missionaries. Because it is, though. It is. Not because we're conjuring this up, because it is. I'm not trying to obscure the nature of God's Word. I'm trying to expose it for what it is. And sometimes the best way to do that is to shed language that, has, that is baggaged and use fresh language. So the way, I, well, the way mm. I do this is I say, would you please share your testimony with me? And it, they can share their, I know that Thomas Monson is a true prophet. I know the Book of Mormon is true. Sure. And Joseph Smith is a true prophet. Sure, sure. After they're done bearing their testimony, I ask, would you mind if I shared a testimony as well? Well, of course. Well, actually, the testimony I have to share is not my testimony. It's God's testimony. And I like to open up Isaiah 43.10, mm -hmm. have them look at it, and put my finger under it, and I can quote 
before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Right. And I like to preface it like, well, imagine God's at a fast and testimony meeting. He's behind the pulpit. He's bearing his soul to you. He's bearing his heart. His hands are out. Or I guess Mormon, Mormons don't necessarily do that uh, culturally, but sure. they're, they're bearing their testimony. Think of all the ways a Mormon would bear their testimony in a heartfelt way. Well, imagine God bearing his testimony. This is what he has to say before me. No God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Mm -hmm. Now, what I like to say afterwards is if we accept the testimony of man, right. how much more should we accept the testimony of God? So it's just my way of appealing to God's authority. And it, it lets them understand. I mean, if we look at this passage, it, it is a very strong passage. Isaiah 43, 10 starts, You are my lit, in the ESV, it says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, and you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. I mean, he prefaces it, declaring who He is and, and emphasizing who He is. And he says, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I am the Lord, it goes on to say in verse 11. And besides me there is no Savior. Mm -hmm. But this kind of runs contrary to what we see in Mormon theology. The traditional Mormon doctrine, okay. if I could call it one, or teaching, is as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. The Lorenzo Snow Couplet sure. uh, summarizes that, uh, pointing traditionally to this idea that God was once merely a man who progressed into Godhood, and that we can follow that same pattern that he did and progress into Godhood, even as sinful men. But, but, but the issue here is we have a, you say the traditional doctrine, we're going to talk about these floating doctrines. Yeah, I try to qualify it. Right. But the, the problem is, is we have a passage here that's very clear. This is God's testimony. He's saying, he's actually going right opposed to the Lorenzo Snow couplet. It's actually almost a parallelism if you put the two together. Uh, one's contrasting the other. You know, Mormonism is saying that before God, many gods, uh, Joseph Smith said, you have got to learn how to become gods as all the gods did before you. Sure. So, go ahead. So, so my question is this, what have been some of your responses? Have you gotten many or well, have, the, you, have you been The most been common response sides? I get is, well, that's just talking about wooden idols. Right. So I like to ask, well, let's just talk, let's, uh, let's look at that <clears throat> in that light. What if it really did say that before me, no wooden idols were formed, nor shall there be any wooden idols So you idols change the words in there. I try to so, inject the meaning that they think is in there. Okay. And then there, it's, it's obvious that there have been wooden idols before, formed. Before and after. Yes, at any reference point you put out there, well, a so lot that, of reference that points. that doesn't yeah. work. Then. It doesn't work. The other thing is, well, that's just talking about this world or this space-time continuum or this galaxy or this spiritual dominion that our particular God happens to be over. And I ask, can you think of anything in the, in the book of Isaiah or the Bible that relativizes God's dominion. Is this, an, is this an example of God trying to uh, specify and relativize his dominion, or is it, tr is it, tr is it a, a superl is it superl superlative language? Is sure. it big, awesome language? I mean, how far does God have to go in his language to make his point? Right. I mean, it's very absolute language. So, so they try to justify it and, and say that it only applies to this particular time continuum in this world, but there's other worlds that parallel or uh, Traditionally, the thought right. is that you can become a god and be uh, a spirit father or spirit mother over sure. your own spirit children for other worlds someday, and that that process has been going on uh, in the past. I think that's a very tough first wrestle with. Okay, you have two of them, and, and I really want to get to this floating doctrine issue. So tell me the, the tell second us, one. Tell our audience it, the second. The second one, one in short is to ask someone if they believe Jesus had the Aaronic priesthood. Now, I've been doing video interviews on this. I'm putting another project together right. on this. And about two-thirds of the Mormons I talk to say Jesus did have the Aaronic priesthood. What I like to do is, is start in Hebrews 1 and start talking, just go on to this holy rant about how big and awesome and supreme Jesus is. Right. He created all things by the word of his power. The first verse, in many times and in many ways, God used to speak to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. goes on to say... Um, he sit, you know, he, he finished his, his uh, sacrificial work. He, he, he doesn't, st he sits now, he's finished. He doesn't stand like right. the others. Um, he, he's not talked to like the angels are talked to. Right. The relationship between Jesus and the Father are very different than between Jesus and the angels. Or right. sorry, the Father and the angels because Jesus is God. And so you can step through Hebrews as best as you can and arrive, arrive at chapter 7 and go through the, don't, don't take out little nuggets merely, but go through the logic of Hebrews 7. And in short, the Because it's a sermon. It's Hebrews 7. It's, I mean, Hebrews is a sermon, it's really. It's built like a sermonic right. unit, right? right? So in Hebrews 7, we have this logic that depends on Jesus not having had the Aaronic priesthood. So it argues that because he wasn't 
an Aaronic priest. He sh should have been another kind of priest. And that's why the parallel is being made with Melchizedek. And there's a couple uh, connections there, parallel connections. One is that there's no genealogy given to Melchizedek. He's without beginning or end of days. And the other is that he's uh, superior to those who are associated with the Aaronic priesthood. Right. Uh, so he's after the order of Melchizedek in that sense. There's no talk of laying on of hands, no, none of this uh, ordained bestowal. Now wait, let's talk about this laying on of hands because you mentioned this in the conference and I thought this was, I personally thought this was really impactful. We don't see anywhere of laying on of hands you, well, in, in when and we're passing on. Go ahead. In, in the context of passing on priesthood. In the passing on so you can see yeah. examples of Jesus putting his hands on people to heal them. You know. He, rubs mud in their sure, eyes yeah. and everything. He spit, but, he's, well, he, that was a spit there too. Right? <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting <laughs> is when Jesus tells them, the apostles, to go preach. You know, in, if you put all the gospels together, you get Jesus, you have Jesus breathing on the disciples. You have them t telling them to do things, but you never ha have Jesus laying. I like to ask Mormons, I remember missionaries, can you think of any examples where Jesus laid his hands on the apostles to give them any sort of authority to do what he told them sure. to do? Now, I would readily admit that the laying out of hands is a practice in the New Testament. It's something that we should do today in the Christian church. But the question is, is it an absolute mechanism for the bestowal of God's authority? Right. Or, or does, is there a pattern, a theme in Scripture that shows that God doesn't need physical touch? He doesn't need these ordinances to pass on authority. It, when, he, when he speaks, entire galaxies come into existence. Right. And when he says, go do that. Remember the, the guy who came to Jesus and said, my son is sick. And Jesus wasn't even in the vicinity. And he goes, just go home. Your son's going to be fine. Sure. And, uh, and he was fine. But this is, this is problematic, Aaron. I mean, and this is a question that I've asked many people, and not just LDS people, but, but, but even other uh, pseudo-Christian religions, where they, they've said that uh, the, the Jehovah's Witness is a prime example of this, um, but in a different way. But I, I asked them, show me in the Bible where the belief systems you have for salvation or for, in this place, the passing on, show me where it is. If it's that important, why is it not here? And I yeah, think that's important. something that that we need to be talking about. I mean, am right. I wrong? I mean, I, I've asked that question. They're like, well, it's in there. Mormonism treats priesthood authority as a central part of the restored gospel right. and a central part of the Christianity that was once lost. My big question is, if Christianity was scattered geographically, if these letters were being widely distributed, then you would basically have to adhere to some sort of conspiracy theory to, to argue that all these references to priesthood authority and, and a bestowal of priesthood authority and the continuation of an Aaronic priesthood that the New Testament, Hebrews calls the Aaronic priesthood weak, obsolete, and useless. I mean, it doesn't speak of it as though it's being continued. It doesn't open it up to the Gentiles. It doesn't say Jesus had it. It depends on Jesus not having had it. Um, there's no talk of uh, Melchizedek priesthood being handed down from Jesus to another or from apostle to apostle or whatever. Uh, if you're going to have priesthood authority as a central part of the restored Christianity of Mormonism, then it, it seems historically likely that you would find at least one explicit reference in the New Testament to it, in any of the New Testament books. But you, you kind of have to lean back on a conspiracy theory that it was taken out early, early on. But anyway. I think those are two good, useful tricks. Uh, uh, tips to, to use for people because... Were you going to say tricks? No, I wasn't. But, <laughs> but I, I stumbled on tri trips. I was going to say trips is what I was going to say and that wouldn't have come out very well. Sorry. Right. But two useful tips to come across to do this. Now, just just I want to check our time, but one of the things that, that really got me in, and this is something I know about you as being your friend for a, a long time and um, a long time is relative, right? We've known each other for five some odd years. Uh, or thereabouts, maybe three or four. But the, the point is, is you have this heart for LDS people. And as you were addressing this next issue that we're going to go into of the doctrines, one of the things I saw that was dis different about your presentation of that I see from a lot of apologists. Because a lot of apologists will say, this is the doctrine, this is how you have to attack it, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is how you address a Mormon of this doctrine. But your issue wasn't necessarily the fact that there's all these floating doctrines that aren't substantiated by anywhere or that are substantiated but they don't adhere to, right? They don't seem to be pinned down anywhere, but it was how it affects the LDS people. And this heart thing, I, I want our viewers to know because, you know, by all means, we talk about a lot of things on this program. We definitely by no means just talk about one subject. We don't talk about one. I mean, we're always talking about Christianity, but I, I definitely don't address when I do witnessing tips. I mean, we'll, if you go to Catholicism, we've got, uh, we've, we've done stuff on Islam, and we, we address the broad gambit here, but the, the heart here is definitely different, and, and that's something that you really bring to the table here when we talk about these doctrines is the core is the heart of the LDS people. The core is the salvation of the LDS My people. My presentation focused on the, 
the idea that as Christians, we shouldn't get hung up or we shouldn't let Mormon apologists or missionaries or whoever let us get up hung up over this abstract uh, idea of what constitutes official Mormon doctrine. I'm saying let's move away from that and start talking about what really impacts the hearts of real Mormon people. Right. And even and secondarily, even if something doesn't uh, impact the real Mormon people, it can call into question the religious identity of someone who claims to be a prophet or apostle or just a teacher. So Jesus said, watch out for false prophets, watch out for false teachers. You'll know them by their fruits. If we're going to trust and obey Jesus Christ, we're going to care about what people have said in 2009, in 1830, in 1855. Right. So Adam God really matters because it calls into question uh, Brigham Young's uh, being a true or false prophet. But I, I hear him say all the time, but that's not official church doctrine. And even if it's not official, and even if it's not a modern doctrine, even if it's not emphasized, I really care about what Mormons really actually believe. So I, I want to take a holistic approach to understanding what the institution's teaching, what the popular literature is teaching at Deseret Book, and I want to know what the oral traditions are and how all of that relates. So, for example, there's this issue of did God the Father have physical relations with Mary? Did God have sex with Mary? Sure. Put it bluntly. And you'll not, you will not find that in modern institutional Mormon literature, but it's still a real part of the Mormon oral tradition. And that the presence of that oral tradition is due both to the statements of LDS leaders, so that oral tradition was initiated by and fostered by LDS leaders, and by a natural extension of the Mormon worldview. So my thing is the, the institution still has to account for that and take some responsibility. Right. And Mormon, uh, Mormon members when they're uh, challenged with these really tough issues like, you know, your leaders did teach that we were, that J Jesus was conceived in the same way that any other man was conceived on earth. When they're, when they're challenged with that, they might say, well, that's an official doctrine, so I want to talk about it. It's not, it doesn't really matter. I'm saying, well, look, these issues, you're, you're the, the big, if I could go straight to the issue, the one issue I yeah. like to really hit yeah, on. Yeah, that's fine. I like to ask people, do you think God the Father could have been a sinner? Right. I don't know of any more important issue for Mormons to consider. And you did a video on this, which is really impactful. I want people to go to GodNeverSinned.com. And th what that basically is, it's a project of mine where I interview Mormons. And I ask them, among other questions, do you believe God the Father could have been a sinner? Now, one of the motivations I had for doing this was that I've had all these Mormon apologists tell me, Aaron, when you hit on this issue, you're misrepresenting us as a people because we don't believe that. That's not our official doctrine. Well, look, I don't care if it's official or not. Is this a real part of the Mormon oral tradition that the Mormon institution is just letting exist? About two-thirds of the Mormons I've asked on the street have said, yes, God the Father could have been a sinner. And I asked them, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel good. Some people said, it makes me feel awesome. It makes me feel comfortable because they say, I can become a God uh, just like God the Father became a God, even though I'm a sinner. Right. Now, that matters whether or not it falls within the scope of officiality. Right. Whether, whether the church has stamped that or not, it affects the, the individual, and that's really where you have the, a heart for these if, people. If you have a connection, a relationship with the God of the Bible, right. you're going you're gonna to have this hard attitude where when you, come a, when you come across God's holiness, you say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Right. I'm small, God is big. I'm a sinner, God is holy. And, when, and the best analogies that I've, I've heard or metaphors is standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Right. You're not a, you, don't, you don't get offended that the Grand Canyon is making uh, small of you. You're, you're glad to be swallowed up in something so much bigger than you. Or Piper's analogy of hand gliding in a big hurricane. Yeah. It's awesome. You're being swallowed up by an awesome God. Now, if, if you know the God of the Bible, if you really know the God of the Bible... Can you say in your heart, I don't know whether God was a sinner? Yeah. Can you say in your heart, God could have been a sinner? Or can you say in your heart, well, I don't believe God could have been a sinner, but it's an acceptable position to hold. Any three of those don't work. If you know the God of the Bible, this is not one of those mode of baptism issues. Right. This is not the color of the carpet in your church issue uh, issues. This is a core issue. I can't, th I, I, if I could be really clear with Mormons, and anyone else. This is more, this more important than whether you have a girlfriend or boyfriend. It's more important than whether you have clothes on your back. It's more important than whether you ever eat again. It's more important than whether you have parents living. Right. This is more important than whether you have limbs. This is <laughs> more important than, than whether you 
this is, there's nothing more important than I can think of in this life. Right. Than knowing whether God was a sinner or not. To know the God of the Bible is to know him as a God who was from eternity to eternity absolutely holy. Right. And the, the, the Mormon worldview has, has fostered within the people, the real, their hearts, that God could have been a sinner. It's a natural extension of the traditional worldview. Sure. Sure it is. I'm, no, no, and it very much is. And, and you hit on the two things that I think is really important. First, you, you really just have a heart and, and such a heart to spend so much time and dedication to trying to reach out um, and, and share with them the good news of the gospel. And that is that God is big and wonderful and magnificent. And then when we scale him down, he becomes this nothing that, that doesn't have the power to save, that doesn't have the power to create, that doesn't have any of the, 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 uh, the, the core attributes that we see in the Bible. Mm -hmm. the, the attributes that we see in the Bible is this big, magnificent, holy and wonderful and perfect God. But yet these doctrines destroy that. And I, they can't run parallel one one another. They they conflict with one another mm -hmm. very, very, uh, very obtusely. Is if that's I a had a good Mormon word. friend talking with me over email, and he said, you know, it seems like as long as you have a relationship with God, it doesn't really matter what kind of doctrine you have. And I said, well, let's think about that for a second. Oh, wow, wow. Even even in Mormonism, wouldn't we agree? I said with my friend, wouldn't we agree that Mormonism teaches that our relationship with God is not of of master and slave, at least explicitly. It's not of employer and an employee. In an explicit manner, it's like, no, it's father sure. and son. Mormonism sure. would, would promote sure. the idea. So the kind of relationship with, that you have with God is important. Yeah. The foundation that you're standing on for that relationship is important. Is it a foundation of God's helping me prove my worthiness to mm. qualify for eternal life? Or is it a foundation of I have received eternal life as a free gift and the forgiveness of all my sins so that God gets all the credit right. and I can enjoy him forever, right. increasingly. Is this relationship, there's a, there was a recent Insight article that says that the relationship between, um, there's no uh, distinction between creator and creature uh, in Mormonism. This is one of the apostles that came out and said right. this. There's no creator-creature distinction because uh, God doesn't really create anything in Mormonism. He organizes it. He takes but that, that which is pre-existing. But I, I would plead with the Mormon people that if you don't know in your heart with confidence by the Holy Spirit that God never sinned, maybe you don't know God. Yeah. Because this God that we know, I mean, I, if I... If, if it, well, it's, at ahead. the very least, it's definitely not the, the same God. And, and that's part of the attribute, right? Because if, if we have a relationship with somebody, but we're defining this individual, I mean, listen, if, if they believe that God was a sinner and we believe that God is magnificent and holy and He's the Alpha and the Omega, and you see what I'm saying? This is not the same type of relationship because we're having, yeah, this is having a relationship with a different, right. a different entity. I, if I knew that God somehow could have been a sinner, I would not uh, release from my heart this unadulterated worship right. that, I, that I experience. I would not have the same attitude toward Him. And I, I just, so I would point people to Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, mm. thou art God. There's some good, good passages in the Book of Mormon that reflect Joseph Smith's early ideas about God, which were more Protestant-ish. Sure. So one of the things I said in my presentation is, I believe the doctrines of the Book of Mormon more than Mormons do. It's doctrinally an irrelevant piece of literature today. It, it's part of the Mormon experience. It's an important part. But today, it's obsolete doctrinally mostly. Yeah. So there's some water anyway. Because there's things in there like modalism and stuff like that that we that, that, that's not reflective that in neither their current, tradition. Yeah. Right. In their in their belief system, you know, I hope I hope our audience can understand and see you know that these there are some really good ways that you can talk to your Mormon friends and you can share with them you can share them with them your belief uh, in the Christ of the Bible and the God of the Bible and so they understand clearly what those distinctives are and what the repercussions are. Because really, at the end of the day, Aaron, this, this comes down to people, this comes down to people's hearts, this comes down to salvation. And as Brian said just recently, which I thought was fantastic, this comes down to your life in the kingdom yeah. and your life in the kingdom beginning today. And, you know, you, you see a lot of good orthopraxy coming out of the, the, the Mormon place, but there's no really good, there's not good orthodoxy behind it because it's all these If you, if you try to sever the fruit of godly behavior with the root of truth, right. your tree is gonna, your fruit's gonna be dead. Mm, that's an interesting thing. It's, Say that one more time. If, if you try to sever the fruit of obedience and holiness right. from the root of truth, you're not trusting God, right. and what you think you have is is dead. Right. It's a dead faith. It's a dead works. 
The only works that God wants from us come from a heart freely and fully forgiven by faith alone. Wow. Because That's he it. gets all the glory, all the credit. Right. It's all his. He gets it all. Huh. Well, thank you for being on the program, buddy. You know it's uh, ending faster than I always think it's going to, and <laughs> here we go again. So Grace and peace, Appreciate man. it, man. Thanks appreciate a lot. it. If I might address you, um, encourage you to continue to reach out to your friends and family. Again, no, no distinctives on who they are. Lost people are lost people. And uh, to our Mormon friends and family who are watching and, and neighbors, listen, Aaron Shoffel Wallaf, if you don't know the man, and I do, has such a heart for the LDS people. It is amazing. And, it, and realistically, I know I get the, the, the flame letters for this, and that's fine. And, and you need to understand something. It's perfectly, perfectly acceptable to have a doctrinal discussion because what he exuded here is love, is compassion, and is addressing doctrinal issues, not people issues. Listen, Aaron loves people. He's just addressing doctrine. He's addressing theology. And he's addressing how that affects those people. So please look at that and examine that. Go to some of the resources. Listen, MRM.org is fantastic. Do the research yourself. I always tell you on the program, do the research yourself, get your Bibles, open them up, and see if what is being told to you is true. Always. Whether it's me, whether it's Aaron, whether it's your current local pastor, it doesn't matter. Or 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 maybe you're not in a, in a Christian church. Open up the Bible and see if it's true. That's what the Bereans did. They searched the scriptures to seek out to see if what was being told to them was true. Because, listen, there's a lot of doctrines out there that say a lot of things, and they might not have anything to do with the God of the Bible, His holiness, His perfectness, and more important, His salvation. And He has His salvation plan that if you understand where you sit with God, as you sit in front of God as, a, as someone who has sinned against Him, and this mighty, holy, perfect, and just God who is also loving, you've sinned against this God, what you need to do is repent. Put your faith and trust in Christ. This is what the Bible says, that if you'll trust in Him alone, if you'll believe who He is, you'll repent, you'll turn from sin, and put your faith and trust in Christ, He will save you and make you a new creature, and you will change from the inside out and live in the kingdom of today. This is important to do because evangelism, it's about eternity. Come cool.